hello and welcome to the first in my A-level series of video lectures that I'm going to start this year. And we're going to start at the very beginning of the syllabus, because that makes sense, by looking at processors, input, output and storage devices. And this lesson is going to be on the von Neumann architecture. So this is aimed at A-level students, if you're a GCSE level student, or if you'd like the same material but slightly simplified, check out the GCSE syllabus video. I'll put a link in the description underneath. All right, so we're going to be learning about the characteristics of contemporary processors, input, output, and storage devices in this series of video lessons. We've got lots of different things we need to look at, and we're just gonna go through step by step, and I think in about six or seven videos. Okay, a bit of historical background. So, the growth of computers, the development of computers, was really spurred by World War II, specifically cryptography and ballistics. Cryptography is breaking codes. So, for example, what the Germans um, did in World War II is they had the Enigma code, the Enigma machine, that could code, lesson, uh, code transmissions in such a way that the Allies couldn't break it. Uh, even teams of skilled mathematicians and cryptographers could break it. So we needed to develop early computer systems to break those codes. We also have ballistics, basically firing rockets and artillery in such a way that they're actually going to get to the right place and blow up the enemy and not your allied troops. So these, all these things require a lot of math skills, a lot of calculations. And as we should know, computers are much better at that than people. So we had things like the British Colossus computer, the American ENIAC system, early World War II-ish computer devices. The problem with these wartime computers was that they were programmed more or less by rebuilding the entire machine to carry out a different task. So you had to go into the machine, rewire it, change all these valves and cylinders and things before you could run a different program and do a different calculation. So for example, one of these early computers, the American ENIAC system, took three weeks to rewire to do a different calculation. So can you imagine that being applied to today's computers? Okay, I'm finished using Word. I want to run Excel. I'm now going to have to completely rebuild all my circuits inside the machine, and that's going to take me weeks so I can run a new program. Okay, so we needed a better way of doing that, and a lot of the really smart people who are into early computer technology we're coming up with plans and theories of ways to build better computers. So this brings us to a guy called John von Neumann. So he was one of the big brains of the 20th century. He was a gifted mathematician and physicist. He moved from Hungary to America in the 1920s, and he was important in all kinds of fields. Uh, for example, in computing, he invented the merge sort, merge sort algorithm, amongst many other important discoveries. So if you talk to mathematicians or computer scientists or lots of different people, they can really tell you how wonderful this guy was. He was involved, for example, in the Manhattan Project, where they were building the first atomic bomb, all kinds of things. So... He came up with a idea for a new computer architecture, which is variously known as the stored program computer, or perhaps more commonly nowadays, the von Neumann architecture. And he published a paper on this, I think, in about 1945. So right at the end of World War II, just as computer technology was really starting to develop and become useful. So the von Neumann architecture has different, some various features. It has a single control unit. It works sequentially through instructions. But the key idea, the really big idea that you've got to grasp is that it was all about storing instructions and data together in the same memory unit. So that's in red here. I'm going to underline it. That is the key fact. And nowadays we take this for granted because this is how machines just work for us. This is how computers are built. But this was his big idea. This novel idea meant that a computer built with this sort of architecture would mu be much easier to reprogram. Effectively, the program itself is treated as data. 
So in the memory of the machine, you've got the data, but also the instructions. The instructions are also data held in the same memory. They're both held as binary data, and you can just change what's loaded in to change the program, which is pretty much what we do today. But this was a really big revolutionary idea. So here we've got the classic von Neumann architecture diagram. Uh, it's worth making a note of this because if you can remember this diagram, it will make it really easy to explain the von Neumann or stored program computer architecture. I'll go through each section of that one at a time. We'll look at the memory, the control unit, the arithmetic logic unit, the registers, the input, the output, and the communications channel or buses in the next series of slides. Well, gone a bit too far there. Okay, so we look at memory. So the computer will have memory that can hold both data and also the program processing that data. So you've got the data and the software. The data and the instructions, however you want to phrase it, are both held in the same memory unit. So on a modern computer, this is what we call RAM, the random access memory. For von Neumann architecture, it's just memory or the memory unit. But both data and the program are held together in the same memory unit. Key idea. We're also going to have a control unit. So the control unit will manage the process of moving data and programs into and out of memory and also deals with the executing of programming instructions one at a time. So this one at a time phrase means that von Neumann architecture is a sequential processing machine. So it carries out instructions one at a time. So your control unit, it is controlling the process, isn't it? It executes the program's instructions, but it's also in charge of the process of moving data from the memory to the processing unit. And it's also in charge of whether we are writing to memory or reading to memory, all sorts of things. So we'll go into the control unit in more detail when we look at modern CPUs, but I think that's all you need to know about it right now. Okay, we've got input and output. Some people forget about this when we're looking at von Neumann architecture or computer architecture in general, but yeah, we need a way for a person to interact with the machine. Yeah, we need a way of putting values into the machine, input, and ways of getting values out of the machine that we call output. We've got the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit. This carries out calculations on the data. So this does the math. It does the addition, the multiplication, the division, the subtraction. It also does the logical operations like greater than or equal to or less than, etc., etc. So the ALU, the arithmetic logic unit, does the math and the logic functions. And we've also got all these arrows on our diagram here. So this shows us that there needs to be a way of allowing the information to flow between the different parts of the computer. So in a modern computer, we call these communication channels a bus. So in the same way that we can take a bus to work or to school, a bus transfer, if I, transfers information around the computer. So the most important type of bus you need to kind of know about now is the data bus. And that is just the communication channel between the, the CPU, the processing unit, and the memory. We'll look more at different types of bus a little later on on this course. All right, registers. Again, this is quite a big topic. We'll look at it very briefly now just for how it relates to von Neumann architecture. So basically, a register is a discrete memory location within the processing unit designed to hold data and instructions temporarily. Because you can store all this in memory, but if you're going back from memory to the processing unit backwards and forwards, it takes quite a long time. So it's better to hold values temporarily in the CPU while you're performing calculations and things like that. So one type of register is the accumulator. And this is the one that's on the von Neumann architecture diagram. You can see that down here. And this is just where we store arithmetic and logic results temporarily while they're being processed. 
So they can almost think about the accumulator like a bit of scrap paper on your desk that you kind of do your working on. It's just when the arithmetic logic unit is performing calculations, it just needs some temporary storage to hold the data while it's doing the calculations, rather than doing the long trip backwards and forth to main memory all the time. So a modern CPU will have a lot of different registers. But for the von Neumann architecture, the one you need to know about is the accumulator. So here are uh, some of the basic key features of the von Neumann architecture. So if you think about uh, how this is going to be set up in an exam, you're going to have to know what the von Neumann architecture is. You need to know what the key features are. You need to be able to compare and contrast it to other types of architecture that came about later on. So what are the key features? Well, we've got shared memory space for instructions and data. It has one control unit that follows a linear fetch, decode, execute cycle. So an instruction is fetched, it is decoded, and then it's executed. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a future video. It does this sequentially. It's one instruction at a time. And registers are used for fast access to data and instructions. And registers are built into the processing unit and they are fast but small and just saves you time going backwards and forth to the main memory. So one thing I should mention, of course, that John von Neumann was a mathematician and a theorist. He wasn't actually physically building these computers. He wasn't an engineer. Um, other people would take his idea and then build computers along similar lines. So I mentioned that the von Neumann architecture was a, a theory published in approximately 1945. I think the first real stored program computer that was built would have been in 1948, and that was in Manchester, England, and it was a computer called the Manchester Baby. So when I say it's the first stored program computer, that can be slightly controversial. Um, there's sort of semantics involved on what's a real computer and what's not, but generally the Manchester Baby in 1948 is the first real working example of a stored program computer. Right, so the von Neumann architecture was super popular. Everybody copied it. Uh, and it is still the basis today of, you know, if you think about basically how modern computer systems work, like your desktop, your laptop, your smartphone or whatever, they are still following a basic von Neumann architecture model with modifications, of course, because that was a long time ago. But the von Neumann architecture, for all its popularity, for all of its great features, it did have some problems. And you need to know about these for your A-level syllabus. So problem number one, the CPU, the processing unit, runs much faster than the transfer speed of the data bus, which could lead to the CPU waiting for data and instructions to arrive from memory. And this is what we call the von Neumann bottleneck. So if you think about it, we've got the memory here and we've got all the processing units here and we've got the data being transmitted backwards and forward. Basically, your processing unit, your CPU, runs a lot faster than you can send data from the memory to the CPU. This takes a long time. Your CPU is really fast. This creates a bottleneck. So if we don't do anything about this problem, the CPU could spend most of its time waiting for instructions. So the instruction gets to the CPU, it's dealt with, and then the CPU has to wait while another instruction gets sent from memory all the way to the CPU, and then it can quickly perform the next one. So this bottleneck is called the von Neumann bottleneck. I seem to have gone the wrong way. Let's go back again. So there's a partial solution to this. Again, we'll take a look at this in more detail later on. But we've developed a special type of memory called cache memory. And this is a small amount of very fast memory built into the CPU. It's not like registers, because registers only do hold like one piece of data, or one instruction. Cache is a bit bigger. It can store more. And usually it stores local copies of often used data instructions within the CPU to save them from having to be transported backwards and forth through the data bus. So cache is a small amount of fast memory built into the CPU that helps avoid the von Neumann bottleneck. 
and we'll take more look, more uh, closer look at cache memory later on. So when we say when we're talking about cache memory, we talk about often used or regularly used instructions. Let let me give you an example of that just to kind of make that a bit more clear. We've got a very simple program here. Four steps, one to a hundred, add one to a variable, repeat until finished. So this instruction here, add one to a variable, needs to be carried out 100 times. So if we store that in the cache memory, it's very easy for the CPU to access. We can send that instruction 100 times to the CPU very quickly. If that were stored in memory and there was no cache, it would have to go from memory to cache, memory to cache 100 times. And remember, there's a bottleneck. That's quite a slow process. If we keep that in the cache memory, it can be processed very quickly. Problem number two. Both data and programs share the same memory space. We've looked at why that's advantageous earlier on, because it makes it easy to change the program. However, it can be a problem because it is easy for a poorly written or faulty or malicious piece of code to write data into an area holding other programs, holding other instructions, and trashing that program. So a lot of modern viruses and bad programs actually try and exploit this even today. Um, if you can get your program either accidentally or deliberately to write data over the memory locations of other programs, you can crash them and stop them working and cause all kinds of problems. So another issue, again, connected to the von Neumann bottleneck is the idea at the rate at which data needs to be fetched and the rate that instructions need to be fetched could be different. But remember, the data and the instructions are sharing the same bottleneck data bus. So again, this can cause a bottleneck because we're trying to transfer the data and the instructions over the same bottleneck data bus. So some of these problems led to the creation of what is commonly called the Harvard architecture. So actually, one of the other names for the von Neumann or stored program computer architecture was the Princeton architecture. Uh, obviously, Harvard is another American university, and some of their experts came up with a different system. And if you look at this diagram straight away, you can see a big difference between the Harvard and the von Neumann architecture, because here data and programs are held in separate memory units, and they have separate buses, separate communication channels to the control unit. So the Harvard architecture is an alternative to the von Neumann architecture. It design, it's designed to address some of these problems, and it does this by splitting the memory into two parts. One part is for the data, one part is for the program. Each part is accessed with a different bus, this means the CPU can fetch both data and instructions at the same time, helping overcome some of this uh, bottleneck from the von Neumann system. There's also less chance of program corruption. Because data and program instructions aren't in the same memory unit, it's harder to accidentally or deliberately overwrite a program instruction from another program. However, there are issues with the Harvard architecture. Physically, more space is required. You've got two memory units. You've got two sets of buses. Handling two separate blocks of memory is more complex in terms of programming. And this means it's just more expensive to develop. It's more complex. It's more difficult to program for. So it never really took off in the same way the von Neumann architecture took off. Uh, Harvard architecture is still used to a certain extent. It's kind of used inside some CPUs and how they handle cache memory. So it's still used a little bit, the Harvard architecture, but basically the way that we design entire computer systems is very much based today on the von Neumann architecture, not the Harvard architecture. All right, guys, very brief summary because it is quite a big topic. These are the key points that you need to know about so far. So von Neumann architecture has both data and programs sharing main memory. It's sometimes called the stored program architecture. 
It has a control unit, an arithmetic logic unit, registers, and input output. It has um, buses to control the flow of information. So maybe a data bus carries both the data and instructions from memory to your control unit. The data bus is slow compared to the CPU. It takes a long time to fetch that data and instructions from memory to the CPU. So we call it the von Neumann bottleneck. We have a rival system called the Harvard architecture, which keeps the data and programs in separate memory. With the Harvard architecture, both data and programs have separate buses to help overcome some of that bottleneck. So we can transfer data and instructions at the same time. However, the Harvard architecture is more complex and difficult to develop for. So we generally stick with the von Neumann architecture. All right, hopefully that was useful. I uh, will keep going with this unit with more lectures in the future. Good luck with your studies, and I'll see you in the next video.